Welcome to another episode of Search News You Can Use with me, Dr. Marie Haynes. This is episode number 111 of our newsletter, uh, recorded on Wednesday, December 4th of 2019. This has been a relatively quiet week in terms of search, uh, which is a good thing, but we've still got lots to talk about. We have some new info from Google on Bedlam, the local algorithm update that happened uh, in early November. So I'm going to give you my thoughts on that. And and um, another, a number of other very interesting things to talk about in the world of search. As always, this podcast episode uh, goes along with our newsletter, episode 111, which you can find at mariehaines.com slash newsletter. Um, there is a lot more in the newsletter that I'm not going to cover in podcast today. So we've got a bunch of tips and uh, a number of other things that uh, really, really are useful. There's a lot of really good recommended reading. Um, those of you who are not uh, subscribers of the newsletter, my team every week kind of finds the most interesting stories on search. And if you're a paid subscriber, you also get our uh, interpretation of the articles that uh, that have been published as well. Um, but even if you're a free subscriber, you can get the links to the articles, and uh, there's been some really good stuff written uh, in the search community this week for sure. So let's talk, first of all, about updates as we always do. Uh, I don't think there was a significant update over the last week. Uh, this time of year, though, it's always tricky to determine. Um, when we were doing our checks for whether sites are seeing ups or downs in terms of traffic, many of the sites that we work with were impacted by American Thanksgiving over the last week. And so I saw, as happens every year, there are people who tweet at me and at Barry Schwartz and at others who, um, you know, monitor whether Google has done an algorithm update uh, saying that, oh, my traffic was significantly down over the last few days, not recognizing that uh, traffic patterns change over Thanksgiving. So with that said, uh, we do see a number of sites that seem to see changes, I think it was the day before Thanksgiving. Uh, still, I mean, I think that that can be a seasonal change. Um, I want to say, uh, I can't remember the exact date in November. We're keeping an eye on that, and I'll report back next week if we think Google actually made something significant uh, enough for us to act upon um, at that time. But for now, if you're seeing ranking changes, a lot of it can be connected to seasonality. As I've mentioned in our last few episodes, Google will often change the search results results when they're more clear that at this time of year, people who are doing this kind of search tend to have more transactional query or less transactional query. And you might find that you're losing rankings to some of the big players in your game, uh, such as Amazon or Walmart, things like that. Um, not much you can do about that other than over time, build up more brand authority so that people recognize you as, um, you know, not just another site that sells this product, but the site uh, that is the name for selling this particular product. And those are the ways that you can get ahead uh, and still beat some of the giants at uh, this time of year. So let's talk about what uh, Danny Sullivan gave us some more information on the Bedlam update. So uh, November of 2019 was really, really challenging for those of us who do algorithm investigation. Uh, and we know Google is always making changes to their algorithm, but they made some significant changes in early November. And, uh, you know, I've been focusing mostly on the organic changes that uh, started on November 8th. We still feel that uh, November 8th was primarily about links. Our big question, though, is whether disavowing links can actually help a site recover uh, that was affected November 8th. I still don't have an answer for you on that, although I think our, our gut instinct is that if you have been heavily building links and relying on those built links for years, uh, and then you saw drops November 8th, then doing a thorough disavow and link audit may help. Um, with that said, so we've had a lot of people reach out wanting link audits uh, since they were affected by uh, this November 8th update. And not everybody can afford uh, what we charge to do a link audit. And so we're thinking of actually producing a link auditing course. Um, I had one out before, and we need to modify it uh, and make it. Uh, there's way more that we can do now in terms of auditing links, because I think my first course uh, came out in like 2014 or so uh, for auditing links. Uh, and that's no longer available online, because things have changed so much since then. Um, so if you are in 
interested in a course on auditing links, I'd love for you to just tweet at me, Marie underscore Haynes. Um, if we have enough interest, then we'll uh, we'll likely get that produced, and uh, it'll be something that we sell. Um, but our goal is to make it so that anybody can audit links. Um, and, uh, you know, there will always be questions that come up, uh, but we think we can give you some information to help you to do this on your own and help you to understand some of the um, troubles that you can get into with the disavow tool. Uh, because if you're auditing links and you're not sure what you're doing, you can potentially do more harm than good. Uh, so again, if you're interested in that, then let me know through Twitter and uh, and hopefully we can get that out uh, uh, in the in the new year. Um, but let's talk about the local changes that started in early November. We think that they started November 4th of uh, 2019. I saw a lot of sites that were affected as well on November 5th. And judging by the conversation in the local search community, a lot of sites are really fluctuating in terms of rankings. And uh, we had, uh, you know, some people had theories that Google was swapping in and out uh, listings just to see who people would click on. And, uh, you know, other people were saying, no, no, my rankings have just dropped and I haven't swapped in and out. And it's a very, very confusing time. So Danny Sullivan from Google actually told us that this update, the local search update, uh, and that's what they're calling it. Uh, Joy Hawkins called it Bedlam because it was just craziness and nobody understood what was happening. Um, and Google really wants to get away now from uh, coining uh, names on algorithm updates. So Google would like us to call it the November 2019 local search update. Nowhere near as fun as Bedlam, I'm sure. Um, but what Danny Sullivan has told us is that this update primarily came about as a result of Google implementing something that they call neural matching. So I'm going to give you my thoughts on this, but you need to know that I am not an expert on neural matching. My goal in trying to understand this is not to explain thoroughly what is neural matching and how does it differ from rank brain. I'm going to give you my thoughts. Um, I'm open to some discussion on Twitter because I think that uh, this is an area that very few of us are experts in. Um, and so I'll share with you my thoughts. And uh, ultimately, though, I don't think much changes. Uh, it's good for us to understand or try to understand what Google is doing, but not much should change in our, um, our our approach to SEO for sites, even with this information. So the thing that's confusing about neural matching is that we had three things come out, not even come out, but be talked about uh, in terms of these November updates that we've seen, either organic or local. Neural matching is one. Uh, BERT is another that we've talked about a lot. And then rank brain is another thing that we talk about. Um, and so Danny Sullivan had some tweets to try to explain the difference between rank brain and neural matching. Um, and the way I understand it is that rank brain helps Google to better relate pages to concepts. And so... Um, as I understand it, it's like Google is saying, oh, you know, you did this search and this particular page that we're going to surface here, it doesn't pertain, uh, contain the particular keyword that you searched for, but it's talking on the same concepts. Um, and so in the past, if I did a search for a particular keyword, it would be hard for Google to surface a page that doesn't contain that keyword. And that's why it was so important for us to, and it still is important, I think, in most cases, uh, to put keywords in our title tags, to use keywords on our pages. We should all be using Google Search Console data to say, oh, look, our, we're ranking number six for this particular keyword in this content, and we haven't even used this keyword. And then we go back into the content, and we add a paragraph that explains that particular keyword. And now instead of ranking number six, maybe you jump up to number four or even higher. Um, we should be doing that type of thing. So as I understand it, rank brain is helping Google understand content to say, yes, you know, even though you're not containing this particular keyword, we know this page is about this particular concept and it would be a good one to surface for people. Neural matching helps Google better relate words to searches. Um, and so uh, the way Danny Sullivan described it is that it's almost like a, a, a cinnamon, synonym. <laughs> a synonym um, uh, finder, a super synonym finder is what he said. And um, so this way, uh, it's like Google can say, oh, okay, you searched for this keyword, 
But that means the same thing as this keyword. Um, and Danny talked about that a while back where he was saying how uh, the soap opera effect um, is something that can cause your TV to look funny. And if I do a search for why does my TV look funny, Google can recognize that even though I didn't use the word soap opera effect, I'm actually talking about that. Uh, and so it can uh, return content for me that talks about the soap opera effect, even though I didn't know the correct keyword for that. So. I think there's some crossover here, and we haven't even talked about BERT, which BERT helps Google understand language better. It helps Google to figure out that this big, long sentence that uses the word without or, um, you know, that has multiple components to it, they're better able to understand that type of query. So what changed in terms of local rankings? Um, so Danny said that Google's been using neural matching for quite some time now, and some of the core updates that we've talked about in the past actually were related to Google using this neural matching. Um, and so, you know, that's that's important. But this is the first time that Google has used it in the local algorithms. Uh, and that's what we uh, are paying attention to today. There were some really good questions by Don Anderson on Twitter. So Don um, has studied extensively uh, things re re uh, regarding machine learning and um, information retrieval. Uh, and she's very, very smart at understanding these things. And so I looked to Dawn uh, to try to get better understanding myself. Um, and so she asked Danny Sullivan some uh, clarification on um, how Google could use neural matching to understand locations. So, for example, what my team and I were talking about, we have whenever Google does something like this, you know, and it's hard to understand, we have a big, huge team meeting where we just sort of brainstorm on what could Google be doing. And um, one of my team said, well, you know, this is kind of like, uh, <laughs> you remember in The Simpsons where... Um, um, they lived in Springfield, but we didn't know what state because there's Springfield in like almost every state, I think, and it's one of the most common uh, phrases. Um, and so neural matching may be able to help Google understand that if I search for something in Springfield, um, which Springfield I might be interested in. Uh, and so it's it's just better able to understand my language. Uh, Danny did say that, um, you know, some of what Don was asking uh, was a little bit more in depth than what Google actually did uh, in this update. And I feel like I'll do it a disservice to try to explain Danny's response in the podcast. Uh, so episode number 111 of Search News You Can Use, we've actually included the tweets from Don and, um, and and added a little bit on our thoughts here on what uh, Danny was saying. Um, to wrap this all up, though, I think, like I said, not much should change in our approach to SEO. We're going to be doing some uh, some investigation into some of our uh, clients that came to us after being affected by this update to see if we can determine, you know, was it particular types of queries that you're no longer ranking for? Uh, and hopefully, as we get more information for that, we'll share that with you. Um, but for now, really, it's not like you can optimize in different ways other than to provide the absolute best um, content that you can for searchers. And I know that sounds a little trite. Uh, whenever we ask Google for years now, how do we rank better? And their answer is create great content. Um, and we see this all the time that people come to us and say, you know, our page is really good. We have all this information and users can find it all in one page here. Uh, and so why aren't we ranking well? And when we compare competitors, Editors, they've got all the same information. And often, you know, one page might look a little more aesthetically pleasing. Um, maybe one page has got slightly more information. But to the user, these are all essentially the same information. And so something that you can do to get ahead is find ways to um, provide people with even more information than competitors can. And I'm not talking about nitpicking and like making your uh, article that was 500 words on how to boil an egg now 5,000 words, you know, that's not going to help users. Users are not likely to want to see an article that's 5,000 words long on how to boil an egg. But if a user is looking for, uh, let's say they're searching for information on a particular product that you sell and everybody, including your competitors, is talking about here's the specs, here's the color variations, um, you know, this and that. But maybe 
meet your actual customers have questions that are not covered on your pages. And maybe there are questions like, um, I don't know which size to buy. You can create a buying guide to help people do that. Or, um, you know, what are the common problems that people have with this? Uh, and so, um, you know, creating fantastic content is expensive and it's challenging and it's time consuming, but this is what we're seeing is helping get sites move ahead. Now, whenever I say this, I usually have somebody that tweets at me that says, but my site has way better content than uh, the sites that are currently ranking number one, two, or three. And you have to know that it's just fantastic content alone is not enough to rank a website, especially if you're trying to rank for a your money or your life query. If you have um, really good content and you're trying to rank for, say, some medical um, information, but you're not established uh, as a, an authority in the medical community, it's going to be very, very challenging to rank that even if you have good content. So good SEO these days is a combination of let's get good content out there. Let's get the website technically sound and, you know, let's see if we can make the pages load faster. Um, let's do, you know, if our canonical tags are off or we're doing something to confuse Google, let's make that not happen. And that can contribute to ranking. And then the whole aspect of EAT. Uh, again, if you're trying to rank for medical queries, for any sort of your money or your life queries, financial, legal, anything that helps people make a decision in their lives, then you have to be known as an authority in order to do that. And the way you do that is you get other authoritative websites to link to you in ways where they're truly recommending like, whoa, you know, we, we talk on this topic, but this particular website has done some really good research and we would like to recognize it. And those types of links are really, really hard to get. Um, speaking of which, I wanted to give you a little update on our Wix competition. So we are jumping back and forth in terms of winning or losing. And it's been frustrating. Um, we're the competition we're trying to, uh, we're one of two teams uh, trying to rank the highest for the term Wix SEO. And this has been a real struggle. I think right now we're ranking on page four or five in uh, Google US, and our uh, competitor who is fighting against us uh, is, is flipping back and forth between four and five as well. We've had some limitations uh, in using Wix, and it's been challenging. Uh, and so we're going to have an article coming out um, uh, hopefully soon. I think the competition is over in a couple of weeks, so we should get that article out soon on what we liked about Wix and what we didn't like. I still think you can produce uh, a decent website with Wix. If you're a small business and you don't have the budget to pay for, uh, you know, a fancy expensive website, uh, then Wix can can do quite well. If you're trying to compete against, um, you know, really big players in your industry, then I don't think a Wix site is the way to go. Uh, there can be exceptions. So, so, um, so if you're interested in what's going on, uh, you know, we would love for any of you to link to our Wix website. And again, it's hard to get links that are relevant. So, we're learning a lot about link building here. Um, we're learning a lot about optimizing this site. And we really hope with the pushes that we're putting in at the end here that we can come out ahead and win this competition. Regardless, it's been a really great experience for us. Uh, we've learned a lot in, uh, in joining this competition. We'll do a little bit more Google news here. Most of you have probably heard uh, as of this morning when I'm recording this on December 4th, Sundar Pichai is now the CEO of both Alphabet and Google. So Larry Page and Sergey Brin, the founders of Google, are no longer the CEOs of Alphabet uh, or Google. Um, they're still there in an advisory role, and uh, that's it's kind of interesting. Um, I don't think that affects our SEO or Google's algorithms uh, at this point, um, so I just bring it up as a point of interest, um, and uh, we'll move on to the, the next topic here. Um, Google just announced that there are uh, there's a new message interface in Search Console. So if you go to the new Search Console, which is really the standard Search Console now, uh, I actually didn't have it in my Search Console as of this morning, um, but I see several people tweeting about the fact that they have it. In the top right-hand corner, you'll see a bell, uh, just like on Twitter or, you know, a notification bell. And if you have a notification, there'll be a dot there. And uh, those are where your messages are from Google. You'll still get emails from Google. Uh, many of us got emails today about um, our search performance, and uh, those will still come. But you can now see these in Search Console. We used to be able to see these before in old Search Console. There's the messages section. One of the frustrating 
interesting things that uh, in old Search Console used to be um, if you were dealing with a manual action. So let's say that a client came to me and said, uh, yeah, we got this manual action. We got all these, um, you know, we filed reconsideration requests uh, a few times and um, and we failed. And then uh, they'll add us on as an owner in Search Console. And then when we go to see the messages in the past, you could only see messages um, since the time where you became an owner. And so we couldn't see the past reconsideration requests, uh, the responses from Google and whatnot, um, unless the people who um, added us onto Search Console sent us their old emails. That apparently has changed now, and we should be able to see all messages that came to the site going back to May of this year, I believe. Um, so that's exciting uh, to see that. So thanks for that, Google. Um, if this was interesting. John Mueller uh, commented on, somebody was talking about whether they should disavow links from sites like theglobe.net. Um, the Globe, I think there's theglobe.com, theglobe.biz, there's all sorts of uh, the Globe sites. And what it is, is it's just basically a list of websites uh, that links out to pretty much every website on the on the web. Almost every one of you probably have links from theglobe.net. Um, and so they look kind of spammy. Uh, and in the past, they're links that we would disavow. What John Mueller said is that um, in some cases, Google will just ignore any links that are coming from a particular site. Uh, and so if Google thinks that it's unlikely that a particular site is going to um, uh, to provide the links, links to websites that Google would want to value, they'll just ignore all of those links. Now, this to me is tied into my theory. I, I really think that um, Google only wants to count links from websites if those websites have some element of EAT, at least when it comes to YMYL queries. And so a site like theglobe.net, it's not like people are talking about it. It's not, uh, I mean, other than me right now, um, it's not like it's known as an authority. It's just a spammy website. And when Google um, actually demotes websites for having unnatural links, it's not because random spam sites are linking to you. It's because you've been doing something to try to manipulate your rankings. Um, and the reason why links matter is because when I link to you, it's me recommending your content. But if I link to you because you've paid me to do it or because, um, you know, in some way I've been manipulated, uh, it's not a recommendation for your content. So if you've been building links, uh, trying to make it look like somebody's recommending your content when really those aren't true recommendations recommendations, those are the types of links that disavowing potentially could help. Um, and again, we're hopefully having a, a course coming out in the future on uh, uh, helping you to uh, make those decisions and understand when to disavow. Um, let's see what else we can talk about here. There was a really interesting discussion on Twitter about uh, Google not honoring canonical tags, uh, especially in terms of syndicated content. So what I mean by that is if I am a, a news publisher, for example, and I publish an article and then I syndicate it out to hundreds or thousands of different websites, um, often what uh, these articles will do is all of the syndicated versions will have a canonical tag that points back to my website. And the idea is that you're telling Google and other search engines that we know there's a hundred different versions of this article on the web, um, but this one on our website is the one that should be ranking number one, uh, the one that we want to rank. And what a lot of publishers are noticing is that uh, the syndicated partners are often ranking above them. Now, when Google's not honoring your canonical tags, by far the most common reason for this is that the content is different. Um, I've seen people say, you know, well, we have this article on, I don't know, green widgets, and we're going to write other stuff and get it published on other websites, uh, you know, about our red widgets and canonicalize it to our green widget page. But the content is different. And so Google usually will not uh, respect that canonical. Glenn Gabe, however, uh, tweeted about um, sites where the content was exactly the same. Uh, and there should have been uh, the content that was syndicated. Really, Google should have been honoring the canonical tag to the original site, and it wasn't. So John Mueller replied to this saying, you know, there's many factors that Google uh, puts into when deciding uh, whether to honor a canonical or not. Um, there's really good information on Google's documentation pages. I'm going to read this out here uh, about about duplicate URLs. It says, if you have a single page accessible by multiple URLs or different pages with similar content, um, Google sees these as duplicate versions of the same page. 
Google will choose one URL as the canonical version and crawl that, and all other URLs will be considered duplicate URLs and crawled less often. If you don't explicitly tell Google which URL is canonical, Google will make the choice for you or might consider them both of equal weight, which might lead to unwanted behavior. Um, and so uh, the other thing that the documentation says is that it's up to Google to decide whether they're actually going to honor your canonical. Um, and there's many signals they look at, such as, and this is, again, quoting from their article, whether the page is served via HTTP or HTTPS. That's interesting, right? So maybe you've got um, syndication on HTTPS pages and your own website is not HTTPS, then Google may decide uh, not to honor that canonical. They also look at page quality, the presence of the URL in a sitemap. So if something is important to you and the canonical is not being respected, make sure that the page on your website is in your sitemap. Um, and so uh, it ends this by saying Google may choose a different page as canonical than you do for various reasons. So if Google is not honoring your canonicals, there's several things that you can look at, but just know that it's not a given uh, that if I decide to canonicalize something, uh, that Google is going to recognize that. If you absolutely need to have your content ranking uh, as opposed to syndicated uh, partners, then you might need to 301 redirect or have them 301 redirect uh, readers to your site. Not ideal or even no index their content so that your site can rank well. Um, so I know that affects a number of you, uh, and it's a complicated situation for sure. This was an interesting question about BERT. Uh, somebody tweeted at John Mueller saying that there, uh, they had a number of pages that were getting de-indexed and running soft 404 errors uh, ever since Google announced that BERT um, was live. Uh, and BERT uh, is not, uh, so John Mueller responded saying BERT does not affect indexing um, and that indexing would not be affected by any update that, um, you know, was related to BERT. Uh, and so this is part of the whole November uh, confusion I haven't looked into this particular site, uh, so it's hard to say, um, you know, particularly why it's not ranking uh, or why things are falling out of the index, but BERT is not to blame for that. So I think we're going to end it there. Um, lots of interesting stuff going on. Just so you know, uh, in the end of December, the last two weeks of December, we will not be publishing a newsletter. Um, my staff are going to be working on, uh, we've got a whole week where uh, we're just helping us to get our business organized and to... Um, get some courses ready and, and all sorts of uh, business stuff. Um, and uh, podcast uh, takes a, a long amount of time for us to prepare. So um, who knows? I may, if Google does something really interesting in those couple of weeks, I may jump on and uh, put out another podcast. Uh, but you might not hear from us for the last two weeks in December. Um, so I'm going to end it there. Um, as I said, you know, we have a bit of a waiting list uh, for site reviews, but we can take on some link audit work in the new year and stay tuned for our course that really should be coming soon. Thanks so much for listening and uh, I wish you the best of luck with your rankings this week. <laughs>